Towards 60. Massimimo is a reality. What is next is the question. And what is Massimimo? Massimimo is the latest version of the cellular network technology in order to send data from base station to users. So the idea is that you divide the world into cells and at each base station here you have multiple antennas, say m of them. And we call it massive number when m is 64 or larger. And we are using those antennas to serve multiple use at the same time and frequency within each cell. So for example we might be supporting k users where k is greater or equal to 8. And then depending on the user load in the network of course this number of users will go up and down over the day. But uh, the important thing is that we are supporting multiple users. And as you can see here if you take the ratio m divided by k then it's uh, greater than 1. So this is also one of the main ideas with Mass and MIMO. We have more antennas than we have users. And Mass and MIMO is a technology that people have been talking about for quite a while. You can read particular about it in my book, Mass and MIMO Networks. And uh, why is this technology of importance in 5G? Well, the signal strength when you're transmitting from a point towards a user is rapidly decaying with the distance. So if the distance here is r from the transmitter to the phone, then at the distance of 1 meter, only 0.001% of the power will be received. And then at a 10 meter distance, it's 0.00001%. And these computations here are assuming a certain frequency range and uh, that uh, we have a line of sight between these ones. So we are essentially taking the distance we are looking at the size of the receiver, we compare it with the surface area of a sphere having the same radius and then uh, that fraction of the area taken up by the receiver is the fraction of power that is received. So the, the important thing here is that this power is decaying very quickly and in many cases when you are not in line of sight it decays even more quickly than this. So what are possible solutions in order to take care of something like this? Well, one option would be to make the receiver larger. So instead of having a mobile phone, everyone will walk around with a tablet. But that is not how you want to build the future user devices. There is rather a trend where things are shrinking in size. So another option is to have a directive transmission from the transmitter towards the user. So in order to achieve that, we are still spreading out power in all directions but we are making sure that most of it is focused in particular directions. And that is where massive MIMA comes into the picture. So if we have multiple antennas, we can focus energy. So here is a case with only one antenna and we have a transmitter here, we have a desired user here. And then this heat map here is showing how much energy that you can observe at different locations. And in this case, the energy is spreading out equally. So this is looking like a circle and then uh, it doesn't matter where the user is, any place that are on the same distance here, you will receive the same amount of power. But as soon as you have, say, eight antennas, and you transmit towards the user, so you're taking the same signal and you send it from the eight antennas, but with different time delays in order to make sure that you get a constructive interference at the location of the user, well, when you have done that, you are getting a stronger signal in that direction. That is also seen here from this so-called main beam. And then there are some side lobes pointing in other directions where you also happen to get some partial constructive interference of the signals transmitted from the multiple antennas. And if you go up even more in antennas, here you have 64 antennas and you're sending still towards the user. Well, now it looks almost like you have a laser sharp uh, signal transmitted towards the user. But there will still be some tiny side lobes pointing in other directions. But the main thing here is that you use the same transmit power the color here is indicating the path loss that you will observe, how much of the power you have lost. So from zero dB and downwards. And you see that the more antennas we have, the more the signal is focused. So we have a beam width here that becomes shorter and shorter. And we also in that way focus in more energy. It's the same power that we transmit, but it's focused. And the good thing with focusing power a particular direction is also that there is less interference sent in that direction and that is also utilized in massive MIMO. So 
M antennas leads to an M times stronger received signal and less interference at other locations. And the idea of using this type of beam forming to focus energy in different directions have been used in cellular communications for a long time. So here is a classical array uh, where we have a sending out a fixed beam that is focusing towards where the users are, uh, below the base station and down to the ground and up, and up in the air. And this one is providing a so-called 16 dBi gain, so it's 16 decibels stronger towards these lucky users as compared if we have a transmitter here that spread out the power in all directions in the same way. So this one we get say 40 times stronger signals if you are a lucky user. But if you are an unlucky user that are behind some buildings here or so, so you're not in the direction where you have this fixed beam, then you're not getting any benefit from this so-called array or antenna gain. You are potentially having a worse situation than if you have a fixed uh, gain transmitter. So what you could do is to try to have more flexibility. So instead of having a fixed beam, you have an adaptive beam so you can re-steer it so it bounces on this object here and make it to these unlucky users, for example. So this is the idea of adaptive beam forming. And adaptive beam forming using MIME or multiple input, multiple output is something that people have been talking about for quite a while. So earlier it was called space division multiple access. Here is from a paper from 1990 where you see you have transmitters here and you're sending beams in different directions towards cars. So the concept of using many antennas for adaptive beam forming in communications goes back to the late 80s and early 90s. Information theory that is describing how you would optimize this goes back to the early 2000s. And there are patents submitted in the early 90s about using this in cell communications. And the motivation is that the data rate that you can deliver within your cell grows as you increase the number of antennas and users. So here I'm showing the number of users that is growing. And it goes from 0 up to 20. And here is the sum spectral efficiency measured in bits per second per hertz per cell. And we can see different lines for different cases, uh, depending on how many antennas you have compared to the number of users. So here you have the same number of antennas and users, two times more antennas and users, four times, eight times. So for 10 users here, you have 10 antennas, 20, 40, 80. And you see that even if all of these curves are growing with number of users, when you have many more antennas and users, you also see a bigger benefit of having multiple users and antennas in the system. So this is the motivation for why you are not only increasing the number of antennas as you add more use into the system, but you should increase them at a faster pace. So you have always, say, four or eight times more antennas than you have users. And this was called space division multiple access in the beginning. Then it was later known as multi-user MIMO. And today it's called massive MIMO. And it wasn't a success immediately. So there were a lot of MIMO experiments in the 90s and 2000s. And there were a few deployments, but no real commercial success. So here is a photo from a Raycom with 12 antennas put in a uniform circular array. And you can still find these things in Tokyo, for example. And since it didn't become a success in the way that we were hoping, then uh, there have been some negative experiences around MIMO communications that has been building up in the community. And one reason why it didn't pay off was that we used circuit switch voice services at this time as the main use case and not data service as today. And when you are talking about voice services, you don't care about if you can increase the data rate in your system. Uh, you don't want the users to get more data. You just want to, them to be able to achieve the lowest possible uh, data rate in order to support the voice service. And then that's it. So uh, this technology was delivering something that wasn't really needed at that time. You wanted to be able to serve many users, but it turned out to be easier to deploy more hardware instead, more base stations. Because it was complicated to build this type of hardware and do the signal processing that was needed for it to work, as compared to uh, just putting up more base stations with simpler hardware. And communication theory wasn't ready in order to say how we should optimally operate a system like this. 
the signal processing and the communication information theory, everything that goes around there in order to design the algorithms in the right way wasn't ready when the first tests were made. And the number of antennas was also fairly small. We have observed later that you need to have many antennas before the real gains are showing up. So actually in the last decade, the MIMO technology has really taken off. So we have been going from the case when we have one antenna. So it's the called sector antenna that I was describing before with say eight radiating elements, but they're all uh, putting together to one transceiver chain that is sending the same signal. So that you're forming a beam towards the location down on the ground where the users are. And maybe you have a certain beam width here of, uh, so you're serving a 120 degree uh, sector and people on the ground. So we can get the fixed beam gain of 16 dBi if you are at the right location, but there is no flexibility here at all. And then we have been evolving this to having eight antennas. And what has happened then is that you take each column here, which is containing maybe eight radiant element, each of them have seven dBi, and that is then giving you the 16 dBi. You take four columns of them, and then within each column you put dual polarized antennas. And in that way, you are getting uh, 64 radiant element, 32 per polarization. And in each column, you can steer each of the different uh, polarizations, but you have no access to all of different elements. So you have 64 radiant elements, but only eight transceiver chains to per column. And then you can form up to eight orthogonal horizontal beams pointing in different directions, but you cannot vary them in the vertical domain. And then, more recently, we have gone up to this 64 antenna massive antenna race. And in those cases, we still have the same number of radiating elements as in this case, but now we can control each of them. And that means that you need to have more cables going into this box. So you have 64 transceiver chains and 64 radiating elements. And in this case, you can form up to 64 orthogonal 3D beams because you can form them both horizontally and vertically. So what is important to remember here is that whenever we are talking about an antenna in mass MIMO literature, what we mean is an input to an array like this. And then that input might be mapped to one or multiple radiant elements, and you shouldn't count them as radiant elements. That is just telling you what will be the antenna pattern of the particular antenna that we're considering. So antennas is the number of inputs. 1 here, 8 here, 64 here, and the form factor can still be the same in different cases here. So what is important when you have many antennas is that you are having the flexibility of sending beams in different directions and you need to learn how to form those beams in a good way. And one option, if you have m antennas in this array here, so multiple ones in each of these columns, is that you can send m different so called pilot signals pointing in m orthogonal directions. And in that way you can let the user device here uh, measure the signal that it receives for each of the beam and then it can feed back an index and tell the base station I prefer in this case the red beam here. The good thing with that is that it's easy to implement from a signal processing and protocol perspective. So you only need to measure all these beams and then make a decision which one do I prefer, feedback and index, and then you operate using that beam. The problem is that if you have 64 antennas, you need to send 64 different beams. And if you go up even more antennas, this is growing proportional to number of antennas. So it's not a scalable solution if you would like to have very large arrays. And for that reason, 5G isn't even supporting 64 beams yet. And the other option, which is something that we have been uh, pushing in the massive MIMO literature is to utilize that the user is sending the pilot towards the base station array. And then all of the antennas at the base station can measure the channel simultaneously from just one pilot signal. And this is ideal for adaptive beamforming because then you can, with only one pilot signal, be able to measure the entire channel. You might still want to uh, have a sequence of a some length in order to push up the SNR, but this is something that is much better in terms of implementing system with a large number of antennas. The only problem is that this is only suitable for time division duplex uh, or TDD, where you are first sending data in the uplink and then you switch to sending data in the downlink on the same frequency. 
In FTD, where you have the uplink and the downlink on different uh, frequencies, you can do this in the uplink, but you need to do this in the downlink. So for that reason, people are mainly considering TDD bands in the future if you would like to have a large number of antennas. So what does happen when it comes to massive MIMO is that we have been going for, from some kind of science fiction idea to a mainstream technology that has been deployed within only 10 years of time. So this was MIMO in the 90s. It wasn't uh, particularly competitive, so it didn't become a commercial success. And it was easier to deploy more base station than use this technology. You had a fairly small number of antennas. In this uh, figure there were 12, but let's say we had around 8 antennas and 8 uses in general. And it wasn't insufficient communication theory, so we didn't know how to operate this in the best possible way. And most bands that were used for wireless communication were FTD bands at that time. So for that reason we could only use that grid of beam approach instead of the uplink pilot approach even if this system was using the TD reciprocity approach. So a lot of skeptical voices build up and had some reasons behind their skepticism at this time. They said that it's too large and too expensive to use MIMO technology, uh, too high complexity from a hardware and signal processing perspective, and there were no real practical gains when you actually put all the reality into the uh, picture. But today, it is a mainstream technology. So here you can see a Nokia 64 antenna, uh, massive MIMO radio, and you can compare it with traditional radio on the left-hand side. And the size is not very large in difference. And for example, the US operator of Sprint, they claimed in May last year that they were deploying a thousand massive MIMO base station in 2019. I haven't followed up exactly on if they did that or not, but that's at least what they've been claiming, and they've been also using Mass MIMO as a key selling point for their uh, network. So here's a slide from the CTO of Sprint, John Saul, where he's actually using some of my pictures as well to describe how you go from a legacy macrocell system where you have base stations uh, that cannot focus the signals very well, so you get uh, strong signals in the center of the cells, but then towards the edges of the cell you have fairly low spectral efficiency. And then you go to a massive MIMO system where you can do adaptive beam forming in order to push up the performance on the edges of the cell as well. And they are saying that instead of having 20 megahertz of bandwidth that you need to separate between the uses, they are now delivering it to all of the different uses using different beams, while here you have to broadcast over the entire area. And they are saying you can use it for horizontal and vertical beam forming, so serve use in different horizontal directions and a different floor in the skyscraper. And when they put this into the real system, they had eight antenna arrays from before, and they went up to 64, they saw immediately an eight times network growth uh, in capacity. They had better uplink coverage, they have cell edge performance that improved by four times, and they have six times better average throughput throughout the entire cell. So these are quite in line with what the literature on massive MIMO would also predict. Here is an example of how their array looked like. This is done at 2.5 gigahertz. And the size of the array is not particularly large. And this is John Saul, by the way. And what they have here is 64 antennas. It's actually 128 elements. So it's eight by eight, and then two polarization in each of these green small boxes. And then they take two of the elements that are next to each other vertically, and they put them together into one antenna. So each of these two here is one antenna, and the blue behind is another antenna with another polarization, and then you do this all over the place. So you have 128 radiating element, but 64 antennas. And in terms of size, this is massive in numbers, but not in size. So here is the Ericsson Air 64-68-64 antenna array for the 2.5 gigahertz band. It's a meter tall and half a meter wide, and uh, one. 187 millimeters uh, in thickness. It weighs 60 kilos. It has a carry aggregation of 3 times 20 megahertz. You can use up to 60 megahertz and it has a 40 watt output power per 20 megahertz band. And if you compare this with traditional Catherine antenna 16 dBi directivity, it's taller uh, but not as wide. So if you put them next to each other you will potentially see that this one is thicker, but it also uh, doesn't 
uh, have the same height. So it's not obvious that this one will be larger than the other one. But there is a good reason why you have a wider array here and why you can instead cut down on the vertical part. And that is that most uses that you have when you would like to serve them at the same time and frequency are separable in the horizontal domain rather than in the uh, vertical domain. So here we are showing the classical array put on the rooftop. It has a down tilt a little bit and then it has a half power beam width of say 5 degrees so it's focusing the power downwards here. If you are below here you're not in the main beam but you also have a short distance so it's not a big problem. You still have a strong signal. But then you have a half power beam width horizontally that is 60 degrees here so you can uh, serve people in 120 degree sector. And people are mostly uh, located in different directions here instead of different uh, floors on the skyscraper. So for that reason uh, what we aim at the Massimo is to be able to have much narrower beams in the horizontal domain. So does this Massimo systems that exist in reality perform in the way that we were predicting in theory? Well here's a simulation study that we did on that using a state-of-the-art uh, uh, channel model. So we are putting up base station arrays in a city that is modeling New York. We put out users in different places and then we are using arrays of different sizes and uh, we are measuring the channels using this channel model. So we have 16 cells, we have around 9 users per cell at the same time. We use the 3.5 GHz band, 20 MHz of bandwidth, 43 dBm per base station, so which is a typical number for the downlink power. We use the state-of-the-art processing that you can read about in my book Massive MIMO Networks. Uh, so actually we were using the code from that book that you can find online to implement regularized zero forcing and optimize the downlink power to maximize the product of the SINRs. So what we were comparing were three different setups. The first one was the baseline setup that was proposed in the first paper by Thomas Mercetta on Massive MIMO. It used so-called IID Rayleigh fading, so all of the channel components are Gaussian distributed and independent of each other. And then we were computing the path losses using the setup that I was considering. Then we have two real setups, one with a plane array with 24 antennas horizontally and 8 antennas vertically. So you have 192 antennas in total. And it's 1 meter wide and uh, 0 0.34 meters uh, tall. And then you have a uniform linear array, so it's 192 times 1, so it's 8 meters long and then it's not very tall at all. And here you can see the downlink throughput per user in megabits per second that we can deliver and this is a so-called cumulative distribution function. So we are showing uh, what you're getting with different probabilities. Uh, so it's random location of the users and how the variations between these different random uh, locations are changing the throughput. So up here, you are a lucky user, you get the good sync noise ratio, and in th that case, the three different curves are almost overlapping. So then it doesn't matter if we are using any of these two deployments or if we are using the simplified baseline from uh, Simimo papers. But if you're down here, for unlucky users, there is a large gap. So the best thing here is to use the Rayleigh fading method from Marsetta. But reality won't contain ID Rayleigh fading in most cases. If you have a uniform linear array, you're not that far off. But if you have a more plain array, which is more similar to what is actually being deployed in reality, you have a large performance loss. So you have much lower performance for the weakest uses. And the reason for that is that we need very wide linear arrays in order to get all the benefits that people have been demonstrating in theory. And that is not what is possible to deploy in the classical way of the having base stations. Even if we are made them wider than traditionally, we are not going to have them 8 meters wide. So Massive MIMO is not the end of the story when it comes to improving the uh, cellular technology. We need to find new ways of deploying networks. Many open problems have been solved in the Massive MIMO area in the last uh, decade. So the algorithmic complexity that people were saying was off the charts. We have shown that it's basic matrix operations using FFTs and uh, so and that are being used. So it's not so hard to do the signal processing as we first were uh, 
believing. The beamforming accuracy can be dealt with by using this TD reciprocity approach by sending uplink pilots, estimate the channels and use it for both uplink and downlink transmission. The cost and size is not a big deal in the end. Uh, so there is already a product on the market, many base stations have been deployed and what we also have been shown in theory is that we don't need every antenna in the massive array to use the traditional high grade hardware components. We can go down to handset grade components instead. So uh, that's because every antenna will not transmit with much less power, so we don't need as um, capable power amplifier anymore. Pilot contamination was a problem that had a lot of fuss around it in the beginning of this area. So the, this is about two users at different places that are sending the same pilot sequence at the same time in order to learn the channels. That is creating some correlation between their channel estimates and when you are doing beamforming based on those channel estimates you also are happen to send additional interference between the users. But that can be dealt with you're know, using so-called spatial correlation uh, in order to uh, use some side information about uh, how the user channels look like and that way you can decouple this problem and solve it and uh, it's essentially resource allocation that is dealing with this. And there are many textbooks on this topic now, for example, my own textbook that you can download from MassiveMimeBook.com. But what is beyond the Massive Mime area? Well, one thing that is coming soon is fully digital millimeter wave Massive MIMO. So what people have been talking about is that this is too complicated to build, you need to use analog beamforming of the traditional kind instead. But here's a setup that was done at NAC where they have 24 antennas, 15 elements connected to each antenna, and in that way they can do fully digital adapted horizontal beamforming. And uh, we will, in a few years' time, see that fully digital beamforming is done at uh, both traditional frequencies and on millimeter wave frequencies. But what is more interesting to think about is the evolution over time, over the next 10 years or so. So 5G is a reality today in 2020 and we will see an evolution of 5G and hopefully we can improve it to perform closer and closer to what we have been talking about in theory. In particular, what is done now is the simplest type of signal processing and there is much more advanced signal processing already available in the literature that can be implemented over time and the standards can also be uh, improved in order to be able to use more and more advanced algorithms. But what is more important is to think about what goes beyond. And I think it's right now, it, during the next five years, where the basic research and inventions for beyond 5G systems will happen. And then the 6G standardization will uh, start and then we can also be more into the applications where 6G is going to be used for. So the question is, how can 5G be evolved? Which issues will exist that 5G cannot solve by just evolving the technology? And what is needed beyond 5G? And the first question is, what are the 6G applications? What are we going to use it for? And this is way too early to answer. We don't even know what the 5G applications are yet. And here's an example of that. 3G was introduced in 1998. And six years later, in 2004, OECD was writing their believed 3D applications. It contains video calling, mobile e-commerce, location-based services, games and sports events, broadband internet, broadband video services. And this was in 2004. I would say that video calling took off in 2010 with FaceTime. And iPhone uh, 3G started in 2008. That was when people were was really using the internet in their phones. So that was 10 years or more after 3G. So whatever application were claimed to be 3G application turned out to be used 10 years later in 4G, for example. So my point is that all the papers that contain 6G applications are just speculations. Probably the 6G applications are going to be what we said was 5G applications, to some extent at least. So what we should focus on now is not what we're going to use 6D for, but which new technology component can improve things a lot. So here are some performance uh, metrics that you can find in 6D flagship's uh, white paper from last year. So having higher peak date rate, lower radio latency, better battery life, more density in terms of number of devices per square meter or even cubic meter, and more traffic per square kilometer, and uh, 
uh, having extreme ultra reliable systems, more energy efficiency and better positioning. All these things can be done by combining a more advanced technology in terms of hardware with better signal processing. We cannot, of course, do all of these things at the same time. We cannot build a system that is able to do all these extreme things. So we need to build a technology that can adapt itself depending on the use cases and move between different cases here. And we need to look now for really radical solutions. If we, in theory, can demonstrate a 10% gain, maybe those uh, gains will disappear when we move to a practical setup. So we need to look for 10 times or 100 times improvements in order to reach something real in reality, something that is worth investing in. And it's way too early to talk about applications. So focus on one or multiple of these different metrics and see what can we do ideally to improve that metric. And then what it's going to be used for is something we need to figure out later. So what is next? Massey Maimu appeared in 2010, Thomas Mercetta's paper, Non-Cooperative Cellular Wireless with Unlimited Number of Base Station Antennas, was considered science fiction. You can't have an infinite number of antennas in the finite-sized world. But then it turns out that 10 years later, it's a commercial reality. And in the same way, we need to think about which science fictions-like technologies for communication applications uh, can we think about in 2020 and which one will be reality in 2029. So here are three of my ideas about that. One is cell-free networks, where instead of having a world where you divide the world into cells and you are served by the base station in that cell, you are removing the cell boundaries and you have a lot of antennas and you let the user be served by a subset of those ones, uh, the ideal selection of them, so that you are taking away the interference between different cells. Then we have the concept of intelligent reflecting surfaces, which are large MIMO-like surfaces where the signal that is uh, incident on it is going to be reflected towards a particular user in the form of a beam. And this can be an almost passive type of surface. And finally, we have what I call extremely large aperture arrays, which are like massive MIMO, but very, very much larger. So more in line with what people have been talking about in the literature. And then we need to figure out new ways of deploying it, because if you only can fit small arrays on the rooftops, maybe we can put it on the face of a building or something like that. And then you can get extremely good uh, resolution how you focus signals in space. So instead of sending a beam, you might be able to focus the signal in just a small ball around where the receiver is located. So these are three different future use cases that I believe a lot in. If you want to learn more, I recommend you to read our paper Massive My Miss Reality, What is Next? Five Promising Research Directions for Antenna Arrays.